In this and the next lecture, our focus will be on what it means for genes to be linked and what it means for genes to be not linked with respect to one another. So let's begin by supposing we have the following two organisms, these two plants. So we have a female plant and we have a male plant. Now, this is the genotype of the female plant, so we have heterozygous for two different traits. We have the color trait, which is given by the letter G, and we have the height trait, which is given by the letter T. So we have uppercase G is the gene that codes the dominant green color, and we have the lowercase G that codes for the recessive yellow color. Likewise, we have uppercase T, which codes for the dominant tall trait, and lowercase T, which codes for the recessive short gene, or the recessive short trait. So we have the phenotype of the female individual, we have a tall plant and a green plant. In the case of the male, we have a homozygous recessive for both of these genes. So we have lowercase g, lowercase g, lowercase t, lowercase t. So we have a yellow short plant. So in this lecture, we're only going to focus on non-linked genes. So genes that are not linked with respect to one another. And so we're only going to focus on part A. In the next lecture, we're going to focus on part B. So in part A, if the color gene and the high gene are said to be not linked with respect to one another, so if we know that these two genes, the color gene and the high gene, are not linked, what would be the ratio or the distribution of the offspring that are formed when these two different individuals actually mate? For example, if we mate these individual, uh, individuals 1,000 times, what will be the distribution of the offspring in terms of the phenotype or the genotype. So to answer this question, let's actually differentiate uh, between linked genes and not linked genes. So what exactly do we mean by these two genes not being linked? Well, remember that our genes are actually found on chromosomes. So let's suppose this is our chromosome that contains our height gene. So we know that, let's suppose we're dealing with this individual here, that these two genes here, uppercase, uppercase G and lowercase g, will be found on a single pair of homologous chromosomes. And what that means is we're going to have chromosome number one and homologous chromosome number two, and this will be our pair of homologous chromosomes. Now, one of these chromosomes will carry the, op, the uppercase G. So let's suppose this is the uppercase G, and so this is shown in green. Now, the other G will be found on that homologous chromosome. So let's say this will be that homologous chromosome, and so it's given in orange. So we have lowercase g, and we have uppercase g. Now, this is one homologous chromosome. Of course, it can have many other genes as well. So we have many genes along this chromosome and many homologous genes along this chromosome as well. But because in part A, we are told that the color gene that is given by the G letter and the high gene that is given by the T letter are not linked, what that means is these two genes types are not found on the same chromosome. And so we're not going to find the uppercase T along this chromosome and we're not going to find the lowercase T along this chromosome. What we're going to find is another homologous pair of chromosomes that will contain that uppercase T and that lowercase T. So let's suppose that this gene, uh, that this chromosome will contain that uppercase T. So this uppercase T, once again, we're only focusing on this individual right here. So we're going to have the blue color for uppercase T, and we're going to have the purple color for lowercase T. Okay, so this is homologous chromosome pair number one, homologous chromosome pair number two. 
and these genes are not linked because if they were linked, as we'll see in the next lecture, these would be found on the same exact chromosome. But because they are not linked, what that means is this uppercase G and lowercase t is found on opposite, on different chromosomes in the same way that this lowercase g and lowercase t are also found on different chromosomes. So we have chromosome number one, chromosome number two. Now, the next question is, what would be the ratio of the offspring that are produced in this particular case? Well, to answer this question, we have determined what the gametes, what the sex cells are, what their genotypes are in the case of this individual, and then in the case of this individual. So, we're not going to go through all the different stages of meiosis, we're simply going to focus on certain stages. So let's suppose we're in metaphase one of meiosis. And in metaphase, what we have is the homologous, the replicated homologous chromosome pairs basically line up along the equator. So let's suppose we're looking at metaphase, we have metaphase one of meiosis. And so what happens is each one of these chromosomes will be replicated during the S phase. And when we're going to get to the metaphase, those tetramer pairs will line up along the equator. So this will be replicated. And so what we form is the following two sister, identical sister chromatids. Uh, sister chromatids. This one will replicate as well. We're going to form two identical sister chromatids and each one of these will also replicate it, but they will be found somewhere below or somewhere above that equatorial line. So let's suppose it will be found below. So we're going to have right over here. So they will be placed right over here. Now, so this one here is replicated, and so we're going to have a green gene here and that same identical green gene here. So we have basically uppercase G, uppercase G, and then we're going to have that lowercase uh, G, lowercase G that are also identical. And then we're going to have an uppercase T here, uppercase T, and we're going to have a lowercase T, a lowercase T. So all I'm doing right now is basically determining what the distribution is in metaphase one of meiosis when this individual here forms gametes because before they actually mate, they form gametes, the sex cells that must combine to form that individual. Now, we know by the law of uh, by the law of independent assortment, we can uh, either have this arrangement or these can be switched. Now, if we have this arrangement right here during metaphase one of meiosis, these will be pulled apart. And so we're going to form two haploid cells. One of the cell will have these here and the other cell will have these two pairs here. And then in meiosis two, these will separate and these will separate. And so at the end, what we're going to form is basically two types of cells. So we're going to form a cell that contains the uppercase G. So we're going to simplify by simply drawing the uppercase G and we're going to have uppercase T. And we're going to have lowercase uh, g and lowercase t. So this should be lowercase t, lowercase t, and lowercase g. Now, this is in the case that we have the following arrangement along our, the following arrangement along the equatorial line of the cell. But by the law of independent assortment, uh, it is equally likely that these two will switch and the lowercase t will be on this side. And what that means is when segregation takes place, the cell over here will receive this one and this one. And so in that case, if that takes place, we're going to form uppercase G, lowercase t on that side. So uppercase G, lowercase t. And on this side, if we simply switch this, we'll get lowercase g, uppercase t. So we have lowercase 
G and uppercase T. So that is the color blue. Okay, and to basically show you what I mean by that, so basically 50% of the cells will be arranged like so, and the other 50% of the cells will be arranged like this. So this will basically not change, but these here will switch. And so we're going to get something that looks like this. So this will be uh, lowercase t, lowercase t. This one will be uppercase t, uppercase t. And all I'm doing right now is I'm switching these two chromosomes. These two stay the same. So we have um, G, G, and then we have our lowercase g, lowercase g. Okay, and so if this will be the arrangement of the cells, then we form this gamete and this gamete, these two types of gametes. Now, the thing about this arrangement is that each one of these are equally likely. So we have a 1-4 chance that this will occur, a 1-4 chance that this will occur, 1-4 chance that this will occur, and 1-4 chance that this will occur. So we have a 1 um, to 1 to 1 to 1 ratio that each one of these will basically form. And what that implies is that in this particular case, because we have a 25% chance of each one of these gametes forming, so let's say because this is our female individual, these will be X cells, so they're going to look like this, okay? There's a 25% chance that each one of these will form. And we carry out the same exact procedure with this, except in this particular case, because we have both lowercase g's and lowercase t's, the only type of cell that is produced by this uh, male individual is a gamete that will have upper, uh, lowercase g, lowercase t. Um, that should be purple. So this is the only type of gamete that will be produced by this male individual. And so we're always going to have 100% of this being produced. But here we have uh, a 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 ratio of these being produced. So 25% of this, 25% of this, 25% of this, 25% uh, of that. And so we see that if this is the cell that is produced, then this X cell will basically combine with the sperm cell and we produce a genotype that is uppercase G, lowercase G, uppercase T, lowercase T. So if these two combine, let's suppose that is case number one, we produce uh, uppercase G, lowercase G, and then we produce uppercase T, lowercase t. And so this is the case of heterozygous, a, a, um, a heterozygous individual. Okay. Now, because this is 25% likely, we see that this, so 1% uh, or 1 likelihood multiplied by 0.25 likelihood, that means this will be produced at a 25% likelihood. So 25% of our offspring will be this right over here, so we can say 25%. So if we produce 1,000 individuals, 250 will be the following genotype. Now, we can follow this same exact procedure and basically determine what the other, phenotype, uh, the other genotypes are. So now if we don't produce this, we produce this, then this will combine with this to basically produce all recessive genes. So we have lowercase g, lowercase g, and we have upper, uh, lowercase t, lowercase t, and also 25% likelihood. Now, if this reacts with this, then we have uppercase g, lowercase g, so we have uppercase g, lowercase g, and then we have both lowercase t's. So we have lowercase t's, we need purple for that, so lowercase t, lowercase t, because lowercase t's. Or we can combine, um, wait, this should be, 
lowercase t. Or we can combine this one with this one. We produce lowercase g's and then uppercase g. So we have lowercase g, lowercase g, uh, lowercase t, and then uppercase t. So the dominant always comes first. And so we have uppercase t, lowercase t. And once again, because the likelihood of this taking place is 1, 1 multiplied by, two, uh, by 0.25 is basically 0.25. So we have 25% chance of each one of these actually taking place. And so we see at the end, if we produce 1,000 offspring, the way that we tell that these two, gene, uh, these two genes are not linked is by noticing that we have 250 of each one of these offspring being produced. So we're going to have uh, 250 of these offspring being produced, 250 of these being produced, 250 of these being produced, and 250 of these being produced. This is assuming that these basically mate 1,000 times. So if we get a distribution, a ratio of offspring that has the